My name is Teresa Davis. I live in East Hampton now for the past five years. And before that, I lived in Amagansett for 23 years. My name is Joyce Raimondo, and I live in East Hampton, right down the street from the Paula Krasna House. I'm Helen Harrison. I live in Sag Harbor, and we are in the Pollock Krasner House and Study Center in East Hampton. I am the director. I was not concerned about the future of my job. It felt strange because we were closed from uh, October 31st to the public until May 1st. So Helen and I were still working here in our own two-person capacity, but on alternate days and checking in with each other and thinking we were going to open May 1st. May 1st came and they said, we're thinking we'll open the end of May. May 31st came and went. We didn't open in June. <laughs> we didn't really know what was happening, when we were going to open. And for me, so much of this job is um, enjoying the public, enjoying the visitors giving tours, talking to people. This is so many people's mecca. We didn't know. We didn't know what to tell anybody. So um, we did finally open July 2nd, and we opened to two people coming, and three people coming, and uh, four people coming. So it, this place usually is kind of an international hub. And it's an international hub because people come from all over the world to come here. It just felt so um, like the bottom dropped out. Normally, we do two exhibitions a year, one that opens in May and goes to the end of July. And then we open another one in August, and that goes through the end of the season when we close in October. But we had installed the exhibition, and we had to close. We couldn't open. And then we were supposed to get the second exhibition, and I had to say I just couldn't do that because it just didn't seem, first of all, we might not be, we might have to close again. We're very fortunate that we don't rely on admissions for covering our app operating expenses. We have an endowment that keeps the lights on. I am a New York State employee, as is Teresa. The pandemic actually forced us to completely rethink our admission policy. See, in the past, for many years, we used to have a single guided tour a day, and then we would have open hours in the afternoon from 1 to 5. And that actually became untenable because we had so many visitors that the place got overrun. We were trying to figure out, you know, what could we do instead and then, of course, the pandemic hit. So we had to go back to being by reservation because we had to limit the numbers. So in 2017, 18, sometimes we'd have 250 people here a day. And um, to me, it was exciting. <laughs> to me, I love that. To me, I'm talking to people from all over the world. So what happened when uh, the pandemic came is that we had to really limit our admissions we could only have six people here per tour. We had to reorganize it so everything became a reservation. So we had three tours per day, except on Sunday we had two tours. So that means six times three, we're only having 18 people here a day. So m I was very disappointed <laughs> because I like action. Um, Helen was very happy about it, our director here, because she, uh, felt like there wasn't as much wear and tear in the place. And now we're kind of pushing the boundaries a little bit, making it eight sometimes. Um, it is really intimate and people talk and there's a real exchange of ideas and thoughts and questions. Where in a bigger group there might not be that much talking. So um, I've gotten used to it and I like it now. Um, but I'll always take, you know, 250 people here because I like that. <laughs> Not one single visitor from overseas came in 2020 because they couldn't travel. That was very unusual. We would have people make pilgrimages here from Australia. 2021, things eased up a little bit, but still most of the visitors were either from this area or from the New York metropolitan area or places from which they could drive. 
My business was a face-to-face -face education business where I worked with children and adults and hundreds and hundreds of people in schools and libraries. And I also had a team of teachers that I sent out. And within one week, every single program, all of my income was canceled. And so I approached Helen Harrison at the Pollux Krasner House, and I said, why don't we do Zoom talks here? And they've been very successful. So when you're with people, especially children, and you see them dripping paint, you hear their laughter, you see them spontaneously talking to each other, you overhear conversations. You can't do that on Zoom. You have to have one person facilitating the discussion. You can't have idle chit chat here and there. You can't give someone a hug. However, what you can do on Zoom is you can invite people who are homebound. You can invite people who perhaps are older who might not be able to make it out to the public event in the winter. You can invite people worldwide who might not have access to the great museums. So Zoom is also a great equalizer. It's very democratic. I got in my car, I opened up the barn, and I was in the barn of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner, completely alone, <laughs> doing my Zoom talk. And actually, I even got to do them through the winter. So here I was in February with the snow falling around the barn, and I said, is this really happening? It was a little surreal, but in a good way. This is a small, fragile site. A lot of the people who come here they remark on that. Oh, it's, it's so small. You know, they think it's going to be some palatial, famous artist, famous studio, and it's a tiny little house. You know, it's only 1,300 square feet on the ground floor. And the studio, the main area, is only 21 feet square. So this is kind of an eye-opener for some people. And the intimacy of it has to be protected. You know, you can love these places to death, like Venice. It just gets overrun. And that was happening to us on, obviously, a much smaller scale. But you, you can use it up, and we don't want that to happen. So we started a wait list, and uh, the wait list is just, you know, lengthy, lengthy, lengthy for every single day. Um, but this was very funny. They have to check in with me at the admissions when they get here. And uh, the last few weeks, somebody came in and said, can I get in? And I said, I, I wish I could let you. You know, we've got limitations and we've got, we can only have six people per tour and it's reservation now um, per tour. I didn't make a reservation and can't you get me in? I really wish I could. I just can't do that. Could you do it for $50? And my docent is standing in the back and he said, maybe for a hundred at least. <laughs> <laughs> so there's been a number of people that are bribing, trying to bribe their way in. And I think it is so funny. I mean, I feel badly for them, but the bri I've never been bribed before. And it's, it's funny because uh, this is a really special place. People want to come here. Well, <laughs> Lee Krasner used to say that change is the only constant. And I subscribe to that because who knew this was going to happen? Who knew how bad it would be? Who knew what a disruption it would be? Who knew how long it would last? We still don't know. So you just have to, if you learn nothing else, you learn to adapt. If Jackson and Lee were living here during the pandemic, I think they probably would have just hunkered down. You know, many artists almost didn't even know it was happening because they're in their studio doing their thing and that's where they spend the majority of their time. Oh, obviously they have to eat, but you could go out and do some clamming or you could you know, go down to the farm stand. You don't have to go to the supermarket. And of course, Jackson had to go to the liquor store, but we won't go there. Longing, longing, I, I felt so, you didn't, you, you couldn't understand um, how things just were shut down. Certain places were shut down, other places were open. Certain friends would meet with you, certain friends wouldn't. Certain friends would uh, keep a mask on, other friends wouldn't. I longed for like um, 
what I used to know. I, it was so odd. I, I know I came here one time, Helen was working, and it was one of my alternate days where I wasn't here with her. And I just ran to her and I hugged her and I said, Helen, this has got to end. Love, because love is what brings us together. Love is what makes us wear a mask for one another. Love is what makes us appreciate all the essential workers. And love is what makes us have compassion. And I think that is the great lesson of the pandemic. Nature. Nature will take its toll on us because we are taking our toll on nature. Now, not that this hasn't happened before, before global warming, before climate change, you know, after all, 1918 was 100 years ago and more, but nature will do what nature does. And we just have to be humbled in the face of that. Mm -hmm.